I don't think the video will work here. Can you try, Bonnie? See if, if you can push play on that. We'll see if it plays. Excellent. So we probably don't even need sound for this. If you've had enough birthdays, you'll remember this commercial. Remember, this is your brain on drugs. This is your brain, the frying pan with the egg. Um, my drug uh, knowledge or the programming that I received as a young boy um, was my phys ed teacher played that video and he said, don't ever do drugs because they're illegal and they're, and they're bad for you. And he sent us back to our classroom. Um, that commercial didn't do anything. So the war on drugs that was started down in the US quite literally had zero, zero success. Um, that commercial doesn't talk about the effects of drugs about trauma, it doesn't talk about substance use and addiction from a health lens. Um, so I always present and say, um, I don't know any of the folks sitting here today, but my intent is never to trigger anybody. Um, some of the information, some of the knowledge you're going to hear today is not always super nice. It's not designed to scare people, but what I don't want you to do is um, and feeling some, some trauma from this talk today. I want you to ensure that you reach out and you talk to people. Don't walk away really affected and feel that you're, um, you know, that you don't have services. Um, so reach out to people that you know and trust. Um, this is a big deal for frontline providers. I do a lot of presentation to frontline staff, um, paramedicine, law enforcement, critical care nurses, physicians even. And it's really about asking yourself, what is your bias and how do you present yourself or how do you view people that are struggling? It could be people that are struggling with homelessness, substance use, mental health conditions, or simply people that don't look to or fit the typical Western success story, right? You have to ask yourself, how do you view those folks? Because frontline people set the tone for that incident. And what I mean by that is if you respond to people that are struggling with these acute social issues, poverty, trauma, substance use, addiction, that incident will spiral out of control very, very quickly if you bring personal bias to that scene. So we have a lot of responsibility for setting the tone. And I always encourage other frontline providers to ask what is your personal bias? And if you feel bias, it's usually because you're lacking knowledge and you have to educate, educate yourself on things that you do not understand, okay? Everybody's heard of uh, opioids before, that's probably safe to say, right? So we talk about opioids, those are synthetic drugs. So we all hear the drug fentanyl, right? We've been talking about fentanyl for a long, long time now. And what I always tell folks is the only people that can administer opioids in the community are advanced care paramedics in Winnipeg or doctors. Nobody else can prescribe or provide opioids to patients. There's a huge difference when you talk about the legitimate opioid supply from a healthcare professional or the stuff that you're buying off the street. Um, and there's a term called uh, kill pills. And a kill pill is often a street term that they reference criminally manufactured pills to look like something that they're not. And there's a really significant supply of fake pills out there. It could be fake Xanax, fake Percocet, fake Oxy, fake T3s even, and they're often fentanyl. And that's not my, my wheelhouse to talk about trafficking and how they manufacture these drugs, but they do a very good job of pill pressing these fentanyl pills to look like something that they're not. So the reality is there's a lot of folks in the community that are accessing a drug supply that they think may be Oxy, Percocet, or Xanax, or T3s, but it's fentanyl. And they do a good job in making those, those pills look real. So gone are the days where you're buying your street supply and you know what you're getting. That is not the case anymore. Um, when at the federal health level, when they're drug testing all of these street drugs, they're coming back for an arm's length of different substances. So if you have somebody that's used to taking a drug like Oxy or Percocet, which is still a dangerous opioid, but that's a pretty low level opioid. If they get a pill and they're used to taking Oxy and they get one of these kill pills, it's fentanyl, their body's not used to that drug. And that could be enough to uh, kill them, obviously. So essentially what happens when people are taking opioids, if I prescribe you or I administer fentanyl to you as a patient or a doctor does, that opioid will travel to a receptor site in your brain. And you can kind of picture that drug traveling to this part of your brain and it kind of sticks, sticks on that site. 
And what's happening with these street drug supplies is you're overloading that receptor site and it's going to turn itself off. And the problem is uh, your respiratory drive system is that same part of your brain, right? So you overload that computer, so to speak, and you will stop breathing. So that's what people don't, don't understand is your capacity for opioids is actually very, very minimal. When you overload that receptor, you're going to stop breathing. There's no control of what that dose is with that street drug um, supply. So it's extremely difficult for people to, quote, safely dose themselves from a street supply. It's impossible, okay? The whole premise of opioids are really designed to treat pain. I think we all know that. It could be cancer patients, surgery pain. If you fracture a bone, you can be provided fentanyl. And what we are seeing happening was patients in the community across the country were refusing fentanyl from paramedics because they thought we were going to kill them. Because they watch the news and they associate fentanyl to instant death. And that's not true. In a controlled setting, fentanyl is a very safe drug. What again we're seeing on the street is things like fentanyl, demerol, carfentanil, oxycodone, methadone. Oh, do you want me to stop? Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yeah. I need to put this in here. I think you can yank that out. I think it should be okay. I think so. Oh, no, I'm trying to get the HDMI. Oh. 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 Plug this HDMI first. Okay. Okay. I was like, do you need to I think just flip it. Yeah. I hope it wasn't something that I said. <laughs> There you go. Just maximize it by the uh, this little hourglass thing here, right next to the app. Just that one there. That should maximize it. Yep. Good. Yeah. All right. Right on. No, that's okay. Okay. So I was just starting to talk about some of the opioids that we're seeing out in the community. And has anybody ever had an opioid here in this room? Could be for baby delivery, traumatic injury, surgery. No, nobody's ever had an opioid, so maybe two of you. Has anybody ever had like a Tylenol-3 before? So you've had an opioid, right? That's what codeine is. So codeine is a very low-level opioid, and what I often say is we're finding with youth, sometimes their introduction to the world of opioids is a Tylenol-3. They're looking for the uh, codeine. Um, so if you have a supply of T3s at home like I do, I used to suffer from debilitating migraines. I was very careful with those pills uh, because youth know if you crush T3s and snort them, you have to take a large amount of codeine to get the effect you're looking for. But what they're doing is they're often toxifying their liver with that much Tylenol. They're taking huge doses of Tylenol. So these are some of the biggies we talk about. Fentanyl, Demerol, Carfentanil, Oxycodone, Methadone. Those are some of what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, fentanyl being the uh, number one drug for sure. Um, we talk about fentanyl being 100 times more poisonous than morphine. And what I encourage you to do, whatever your role is out in the community, it could be just a community member, parent, or somebody in a frontline role, is challenge yourself how you talk about street drugs and don't use the words powerful, potent, or strong. And the reason why I encourage you to not call these drugs powerful, potent, and strong, that's what people will seek. They're looking for those powerful, potent, and strong drugs. It's not a scare tactic, but these are killing droves and droves of people. So don't sexy up street drugs and call them powerful, potent, and strong. Um, that's how people that are addicted, or if they're facing a lot of personal trauma in life, they will seek that next powerful, potent, or strong drug, okay? So we talk about all the drugs and any street drug you can get, you can input into your body in a variety of different ways. You can get fentanyl in a uh, E, obviously. 
Uh, a fentanyl patch is a prescription from a physician and you wear a fentanyl patch on your body, your shoulder, hip or abdomen and you absorb the drug through your skin that way. Um, we don't really see the use of the patches anymore. They were quite big around 2016 to maybe 17 or 18 for us. Uh, we were seeing dealers sell them little dime bags. Some people were cutting them up with razor blades and getting little pieces of fentanyl patch. And some users were sucking on them, eating them. Um, some were smoking fentanyl patches. That does not have the effect that you're looking for. Um, the most extreme case in my travels across the country doing this, um, some people were dissolving fentanyl patches in vinegar and they were shooting them with needles. Sorry. Right? And the, the reaction that I'm seeing from you is very normal. You're saying, ooh, how could you do that? The, the, the mind that is heavily addicted, that is focused on that drug, is not able to process the fact that you're shooting drugs with vinegar in it, okay? Um, up your nose, intranasal, sublingual, people are putting it in their mouths and you can absorb fentanyl through your mucous membranes that way. Uh, we talk about a fentanyl lollipop. Uh, if you're a patient, bless your heart, and you're suffering from cancer post-surgery, your physician can give you a fentanyl lollipop to actually suck on. We've never seen the use of those on the street, but a type of fentanyl that infuriates me, something that's called nerds or popcorn. Um, and that's when they cook the fentanyl, they can add a, uh, add a can of soda, like a sugary substance. It flavors it and colors it and looks just like nerds candy, but it's fentanyl. And what baffled me and when Gilbert and I were out in Vancouver in April, um, Vancouver, we all think Vancouver is everything opioids. They're the experts, which they are. They had never heard of nerds or popcorn. They call it pebbles out there. So it's interesting. It could be the exact same drug, but sometimes they brand it differently depending on where you are within the country. Okay? That one makes me angry because my thought with that is if you are purposely making fentanyl to taste and look like candy, that's a whole nother level of low to me. Okay? Uh, you can inhale it, obviously. The vast majority of opioids um, are going to be pressed into pills. Um, the majority of folks that are using opioids are able to swallow pills. And what you can't think, and please don't think there's a magical green cloud of fentanyl waiting to capture you in. That's not, not the reality. Most of it's going to be pressed into pills. Blotter paper or blotters. Anybody heard of blotter tabs before? Everybody's heard of acid though, right? Which is interesting. Acid is not as big as it was way back in the day. These are blotter tabs. And what they do is they spray the sheet or they dip it in liquid fentanyl. And they're like an activated um, drug paper, basically, that looks like acid, but it's fentanyl. Um, Winnipeg Police did a great job. This was seized in Winnipeg, almost 1,500 blotter tabs. And over the years, I've seen pictures of Jets logos, cartoon characters, rap bands, Ford Mustang signs, it makes their product kind of marketable and trendy. Um, in other bigger cities like rave type settings, um, they were seeing, the paramedics were saying, we were seeing people wear these on their bodies. They're putting them in their skin fold, their armpits or their groin, and when they heat and sweat, they absorb the drug through their skin that way. Um, some other rave scenes, people were actually putting these on their foreheads and they would throw on a toque or a bandana, and when they heat and sweat, they absorb the drug through their skin that way, okay? Um, sticker form, I don't believe we've had this here. Um, perhaps my, my friend Bonnie can elaborate this from a policing perspective in the afternoon, but other jurisdictions are seeing just generic stickers, like job well done stickers, gold star stickers, and they're spraying it with a, a liquid opioid, and people can then take that like, um, um, acid again, okay? Uh, purple down or purple heroin. I think we've all heard of heroin before. Um, when I first started my profession many moons ago in Winnipeg, we were never a needle city. There was not a big appetite for heroin, but it seems to be growing. And purple heroin is heroin cut with uh, fentanyl. So what I always say is heroin and fentanyl are not bad enough alone, let's combine them together. And what's really scary about this is there's also a supply down or down that's beige, purple, brown, black, orange. There's varieties of different colors. And that speaks to the issue again of you don't know what you're getting if you're getting your drugs off the street. Um, there is a population of folks that are looking for purple down, 
there's a bigger population that want nothing to do with this drug and that's sometimes what they get. So another reason why some folks are dying. Um, there's also a supply of things like cocaine that could be dyed different colors. And that again speaks to what we're seeing is folks that are buying their drugs off the street, they think they know what they're getting, but when they're being tested at the federal level, they're coming back for a variety of um, different drugs, okay? Xylazine, this one's quite new. Um, we just found out about this one. I have a good contact in the US that was saying the paramedics are having a hard time treating overdoses. They're not responding to treatment. And xylazine is a veterinary tranquilizer that's designed to sedate horses and cattle, and that's being added to the opioid supply in our country. Um, and that's scary because this does not respond to treatment. So the acute sedate, sedation effect that you get from opioids is being multiplied many, many, many times over. And I don't really nerd out and talk about data too much, but that's really scary when in 2015, almost 0% of their overdoses involves this drug, xylazine. In about five years, it went up to just about uh, 7%. So they're concerned in the US that their overdose patients are not responding like they did yesterday to treatment, if that makes sense. Drugs like this are never designed for human beings. If you're intaking a drug that's designed to sedate horses and cattle, imagine what the, the really big serious impact is on a uh, human being, okay? Nitazines is a synthetic opioid. So you might hear about fentanyl analogs. And basically what that means, an analog is when you take the master recipe for fentanyl and you change the recipe just a little bit and you pump out your own version of fentanyl. That's a fentanyl analog. There's dozens and dozens of them out there. Um, Nitazines were an opioid that they tried to design for human pain control in the 60s but they quickly found out it's 20 times more deadly than fentanyl. And they almost instantly said, never give this to human beings. They're now finding this in our opioid drug supply. Um, so another reason it's not just fentanyl, it's an analog. And what we're finding pre-hospitally as paramedics is people are not responding to the treatment like they used to with the addition of all of these fentanyl uh, analogs. It makes it really, really difficult for us to uh, treat these patients. Carfentanil, you probably heard about. Um, this was really a significant issue in Winnipeg. And whenever I say Winnipeg, that's where my data comes from, but you're gonna be exactly the same, right? This was a big issue around 2017 to 18. It's 10,000 times more deadly than morphine. Um, they designed carfentanil in the 70s to sedate elephants. That's the reason why they created carfentanil and that's being added to the drug supply. I understand it's, it's kind of making its second surge. There's more carfentanil now that we're seeing. And when I talk about that respiratory drive system in your brain, what we can't say is use a scare tactic like all patients will die, that's not true. I can say with confidence, if you intake some of these analogs or carfentanil, you're likely going to die. It's very difficult for us to restart that part of your brain have that much uh, drug on it. Um, benzodiazepines, everybody's heard of Xanax before. So lots of benzo drugs end in PAM, right? Lorazepam, Ativan, Clonazepam, etc. Xanax is a drug that is prescribed often for social anxiety. And what I always caution people is Western society has a pill for absolutely everything, right? If you have a sore ear, we have a pill. A headache, we have a pill. You feel anxiety, we have a pill. It's not an opportunity to hang your head in shame if you're on Xanax. It has its place in medicine, but what we're finding is the youth are playing with Xanax even if it's not theirs. They think if you have some, some trauma um, in your life, you're not getting along with mom and dad, or you're in the system, you don't like your teachers, you break up with your boyfriend, girlfriend, just pop a Xanax even if it's not yours, it makes things better. And the scary thing with that is when you use high amounts of legitimate Xanax, you start to muck with your brain chemistry. And what that gives you is extreme low lows and high highs and you seesaw up and down. Not where youth need to be. Not where anybody needs to be, but it's especially dangerous with youth. Um, I've engaged students as young as grade five and six that are trying Xanax 
to try and push through through whatever they have to um, face. The problem with this again is there's a significant supply of fake Xanax out there. And if you hear somebody call uh, something a bar or a Zanny bar, that's a bar of Xanax. If you're prescribed Xanax, like the one on the left, your physician will say, if you need to dose yourself, break off a piece and slowly dose yourself until you start feeling better. I can tell you they're not doing that on the street. They're just popping that, that entire pill. Um, this one scares me a bit. This was seized in Montreal. They found over two million fake Xanax bars and they tested the supply and some of it came back positive for fentanyl. And that's scary. We have to correct the way our youth deal with trauma, how our youth deal with setbacks. Uh, we, we know a solution is not to just pop a pill. And that breaks my heart when I'm engaging little munchkins in our community that are trading their fruit roll up for a Xanax bar. Okay? Um, what happens when you overdose on an opioid? I'll focus on this for a few minutes. I think it's imperative to me that you understand what an opioid overdose or uh, an opioid overdose or poisoning looks like. Um, remember, opioids are the most acute depressing substance out there. So your central nervous system is going to be slowed down and ultimately turned off by these drugs. Um, don't be complacent and just look at somebody that's presenting maybe like they're impaired by alcohol and say, oh, they're probably just drunk. You don't know that. A lot of opioid overdoses can present initially like they're, they are impaired by alcohol, but it might be fentanyl. So don't become complacent and just say, oh, it's just Corey again. He's drunk again. Not necessarily. What you can focus on for opioids is somebody's pupils. If they're presenting like they've overdosed or they poison themselves, if the black point of their eye, their pupils are extremely small and not reacting to light, they've likely taken a drug like fentanyl. A lot of the other street drugs out there will actually blow, you, blow your pupils up and make them really, really big. So simply look into somebody's eyes. Um, I've engaged thousands of patients throughout my career and sometimes when somebody's not forthcoming with information, I just have to look in, <clears throat> pardon me, into their eyes. Um, another big one is their airway is going to fail, right? It's common sense what happens to these folks. Your central nervous system starts getting turned down and ultimately shut off. These patients could be in seizures. They could be turning blue. Um, if you're medically trained, you can see if you can check their pulse perhaps. These patients often need to be ventilated, right? Because what's killing them when they're not breathing is a buildup of um, uh, CO2. You have to blow that CO2 off and replace it with um, oxygen, okay? Another big thing is um, when you're unconscious and you vomit, you're likely going to aspirate. We're seeing a lot of these overdose patients that have aspirated. And that's when you vomit, you're on your back and you breathe all that vomit in, into your lung space. When you gas exchange, when you breathe oxygen in, CO2 out, that's difficult to do when you've aspirated and that's very, very difficult to uh, treat, okay? Um, I always say in Winnipeg, I know things are different up here. I'm not sure what access you have to 911 or to EMS, but when you stop breathing, that process of irreversible cell damage happens within about three minutes. So if I hit the floor right now and I stop breathing, within three minutes, I'm already killing and what's happening is people are not accessing 911 quick enough. Because in the past, what we keep on hearing is, I don't want to call 911 because I, I'm going to get in trouble for the drugs that I have. And what I want to remind you is there's a Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act that the federal government passed, I think it was 2017, that protects you from criminal charges if you call 911 to save a life and you have recreational drugs on you. That's a step in the right direction because we were losing a whole bunch of people because they didn't want to get in trouble. And I saw it too often when I was on the street, somebody's best buddy was leaving them to die because they didn't want to get in trouble. That needed to be corrected. We want people to access 911. We want to treat overdoses and the drug crisis we're in like it's a health issue, okay? In Winnipeg, what I always say is if you think you're going to have an ambulance at your side within three minutes, it's never going to happen. 
I was telling some guys here before, we do about 110,000 calls a year just within the city of Winnipeg. And I want you to think about that, is wherever folks are within your community, how fast can they access help? Three minutes goes by really, really fast, okay? Some of the interventions that we can provide, this is just a reminder about how sick some of these folks are. Um, it's not like the movies where a paramedic arrives and they shoot some medication up into the air and you know, we, we all applaud. The, these patients are really, really ill. Um, if they're in cardiac arrest, we'll do CPR, obviously. We can deep suction airways. So when you aspirate, we can deep suction your airway to try and clear some of those blockages. We can insert breathing tubes, right? The biggest thing for us is we're gonna secure your airway. And these are advanced procedures that take some time to do. If your airways fail, then we're not able to sustain your airway with a breathing tube. In Winnipeg, we can do what's called a cricothyroidotomy. And that's where we can incise the front of your neck with a scalpel and we access your trachea through the front of your neck. That's not fun stuff. And that's just a reminder about how acutely sick these patients are. Um, sometimes these folks are left with a permanent stoma or like a uh, plastic trach, right? So it's a reminder, if your airways failed, we are going to sustain and maintain your airway however we um, need to do so, okay? We're gonna ventilate these patients. 2022, you're not gonna do mouth to mouth on a stranger, that's likely fair to say, things have changed. If you love and care about somebody or you have the tools to ventilate somebody, you have to do that. People are saying, I called 911 and we gave them the antidote for a fentanyl overdose, but they still passed away. You still have to blow that CO2 off. So ensure you have the tools out there to respond to your, um, to, to your folks within the uh, town to blow off that uh, CO2. We'll start a, an intravenous, that's pretty straightforward stuff. If we can't start the intravenous on you in a traditional fashion, uh, I've started IVs on people's feet, hands, arms, legs, neck, wherever I can find a vein. If we can't access your circulatory system, we can use what's called a bone gun or a bone drill. And that's where we drill into your shin bone just next to your knee and we access your bone marrow. And we can administer the fluid and medication directly in, into your shin bone. So it's a reminder, you start to realize how sick these patients are. They're not straightforward patients to manage. There's a lot of work that goes into them, okay? Um, so naloxone, is that a medication that you've all heard about? Probably some of you are saying no, and that's why we're here. So naloxone is um, sort of like an antidote or a treatment to an opioid overdose. When I talk about that receptor site, it's, it's like a golf tee. That's the part of your brain. When the opioid attaches itself, it's like the golf ball sitting on that golf tee. What naloxone does is it kind of has a fist fight with that opioid and you hope it kicks it off of that part of your brain and it plants itself on that receptor site blocking that fentanyl drug. Um, the problem with that is naloxone only works for as little as five minutes and as long as about 20 or 30 minutes. There's some, some, some variables there. And what happens when that naloxone has done its job, your body will eliminate it and the fentanyl will reattach to that part of your brain. So what we're often seeing is even if folks have their own supply of antidote, if I overdose and my buddy gives me the medication, often when I wake up, I take more opioid because I'm looking for that effect, right? Now I've got twice the amount of opioid running through my system, it will reattach to that receptor site and I'll, I will re-overdose again. So we've had naloxone as paramedics in Winnipeg for a very, very long time. And we actually started noticing in 2012 that our paramedics were ordering more of this medication. So something was happening as long as 2012, a long, long time ago. And when I said I developed this programming in 16, we went from 761 doses in 2015 to almost 1,600 in 2016. That's just the city of Winnipeg. So that's when internationally everybody was acknowledging something's happening with fentanyl. 2016 was kind of that year, right? And when I asked people, what do you think the, um, the pandemic has done for opioids? Do you think we've plateaued, gone down, gone up? What do you think has happened? Yeah, everybody's kind of pointing up. So definitely, and when we look at 2018, people say, why was there such a dip? 
Now, anecdotally, I hate using that word. I think it's a bit of a cop-out, but um, the take-home supply of, of naloxone with uh, street connections in Winnipeg started that year. So that's a good thing. So the antidote was out on the street, but we saw a big increase as paramedics with um, methamphetamine that year. We've always had methamphetamine, but we were seeing it in great numbers that year. Um, the pandemic has caused a big increase. Last 2020, almost 2,700 doses, just the city of Winnipeg. And last year, almost 3,300 doses. So when I pull our data for 2022, that number is almost going straight up again. So on one hand, it's a good thing we're able to treat these patients, but it's becoming so incredibly rampant in our society. Like Winnipeg is big, but we're not that big. We shouldn't be dosing almost 3,300 times every single year. And what we're finding is with the, um, the toxic drug supply, I'll say, the uncontrolled drug supply, sometimes a patient needs multiple doses of, of this drug. So what we were dosing or administering last month, last week, last year is not cutting it today. And that speaks to how lethal that drug supply is today, okay? These are our opioid patients. So 2012, we had 357 opioid patients. And last year, almost 1,900 uh, human beings where the paramedics acknowledged this is a fentanyl incident. So that's not folks that have passed away. It could be, but that's every time a paramedic in Winnipeg said fentanyl incident. And I can tell you that is underreported. Because if somebody is presenting or calling 911 because they have chest pain, they're unconscious, they're having a seizure, whatever their entry complaint is, it may not be captured as a fentanyl incident. Is that making sense? So the fentanyl incident count is really low. It's likely much, much um, higher than, than what's uh, showing there. Um, did anybody pick up on the fact I said 1,900 human beings? I always slide that in there. And when I'm presenting to a small group or a big, large group at a big national conference, I always slide that in there for a reason. Um, when we talk about people that are dealing with addiction or trauma, we have to humanize who these people are. And we have to get away from using words and you'll never hear these come out of my mouth. When you're referring to a human being and a community member as a meth head, a junkie, an addict, a crack head, a crack addict, you are dehumanizing who that person is. And that's something that needs to desperately change. You have to look at how you present yourself. And I, I dare you, I dare anybody to look at somebody in the eye, somebody that's lost a loved one to these drugs and refer to their loved one as a crackhead or a meth head or a junkie. Those are dehumanizing words that need to simply go away. Um, when I talk to society or talk to the community about um, these, these acute social issues, Society wrongly thinks it only happens to one group of people, especially when we look at the big city of Winnipeg. Society thinks it only happens to people that you see struggling on the street. And we all know that that's not the case. I always say addiction and trauma is rampant in the peripheries of Winnipeg, but people can hide their substance use and addiction in their million dollar house, right? Uniform personnel has the disluxury, if you will, to go into these neighborhoods where society naively thinks it never happens. People that you see struggling on the street cannot hide their addiction in their home because they don't have one. So society wrongly thinks it's only happening to them and that's the wrong way of thinking, right? Substance use, addiction, trauma, I always say does not have boundaries or barriers. It doesn't care what you look like. It doesn't care where you're from, it doesn't care what your skin color is, what your background is, it targets everybody. And I always tell a story about when I co-presented with um, a uh, psychologist um, that deals primarily with youth. And what his research was showing is up to 96% of adolescent substance use is triggered by trauma. And we have to make that acknowledgement that it's very, very rarely Somebody is making the decision to try a drug just because they're bored or from peer pressure. It's almost always because of trauma. And that trauma could be in the form of sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental health, right? Generational trauma. 
demographics and groups that have been continually kicked down generation after generation. We have to acknowledge that and be compassionate to the fact that nobody has the ability to stand over somebody and judge them and say, what a piece of crap. Get a job, you bum. Nobody has that, that, that capability. If you feel that way, you need to self-reflect on what your bias is. And we hold a big responsibility in setting the tone of that incident to humanize who that person is, right? We spent many, many years kind of criminalizing substance use and that's, that's what we were trained to do. We never looked at the person struggling from a health perspective and acknowledge that this is likely triggered from trauma. There was a fellow that we dealt with um, on the streets of Winnipeg for many, many, many years, and he's long passed away. Um, and he was a, a man that we responded to all the time. Paramedics, policing, we would respond to him multiple times a day. And I always tell his story by saying, and hear me out, he was the dirtiest, smelliest human I have ever seen in my career. And how do you think society treated him because that's how he presented he didn't fit that stereotypical western success story whatever that looks like so society threw him out right because he didn't have a home and he was dirty and he smelt they threw him out and i remember treating this man one day we stood him up from his wheelchair and out from his pocket fell his world war ii vet card he was one of the indigenous fighters that fought in world war ii for the country we are benefiting from today. And what pains me is when I talk at a, in 2022 at a university, a conference or a modern high school, the vast majority of people have no idea what that history is. And I used to say shame on you and now I say shame on the system for not educating us. If you don't know what happened to the indigenous fighters that returned from the war, you have to educate yourselves. And I message, if you return from the war and you looked like me, your stereotypical white male, you were treated like a hero. They rolled that red carpet out and we were heroes. Pension, benefits, housing, anything you needed was provided. The indigenous soldiers that fought for Canada were one of the first groups to stand up to say, we're gonna fight for Canada. And when they returned, they were thrown out. They were told to piss off and go away. It was illegal for them to vote and they was illegal to practice ceremony. That still, still gives me goosebumps. Most people are oblivious to that history. And it pisses me off that in 2022, I still engage high schools and universities and they have no idea what that history is. It starts painting a little bit of a picture about what generational trauma does to you and how it keeps on rearing its ugly head. And yet frontline providers and society is blind to those issues. You've got to educate yourselves. If you're lacking understanding, if you're carrying venomous hate around with you, you're probably not informed. Educate yourself and ask yourself, why do you hate something? Because you don't understand it. Check your personal bias. Is that making sense? Right? Educate yourself. I don't talk about my family very much, but I always use a prime example. Uh, my son's 15 years old and I always talk about him. The reason why I bring him up is it's really daunting when you look at all of these significant social issues and social challenges that we're facing. How do we solve now today? Look at small, right? Small victories add up to big victories. And what Gilbert and I are doing is we really believe if we throw all of these seeds out there, some of them will, will start to sprout. When I talk about a small victory, it's people like me that acknowledge what my history is and I pass that knowledge to my son to be understanding, to be inclusive. That's what we really need more. We need society to understand more. And the biggest, when I was out in Vancouver, um, somebody asked me, how did you partner with Gilbert? You remember that? And I, and I put my phone down and I said nothing. And I just stood there. And the biggest message is I shut my trap and I just listened. I didn't do anything. 
I listened, and I listened to Gilbert. And what that created was an opportunity for Gilbert to partner with me, which was amazing. That's the most humbling moment of my career. Um, I always say I spent a number of years growing up in Churchill, Manitoba, um, as a little boy. And I love the people. I love the north. And I'm able to bring that down with me. When I moved down from, uh, to the south from Churchill as a young boy, I was extremely confused because all of my friends, like all my school pitchers, were all grains of pepper with one little grain of salt, which was me. And when I came down from the north, I didn't understand why I couldn't be friends with them, right? I didn't understand that. It, it, it was a palpable difference to me. So what Gilbert and I do is we stand shoulder to shoulder. Does that make sense? We provide the same messaging together. And it's very simple. If you're a, a frontline provider and you're not indigenous, close your mouth more often and don't say anything and just listen. It's not up to us to direct all of the time. We need to stand by and listen. Okay? All right. How are we for time, Gilbert? Okay, perfect. Okay, any questions about opioids? Anything that we've talked about? Yep, go for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so the, the question is the, um, I think I have uh, naloxone with me. Um, is there benefit to you carrying it around? I say yes, definitely. If, if you think you're in an environment where you may encounter somebody that's overdosed or uses fentanyl, absolutely, right? And so we're gonna talk about that, I think after lunch maybe, or maybe, yeah, um, where Norway House can be sort of like a hub for that antidote, right? You, you can access that naloxone for free. You can train yourselves to use it. It's extremely, extremely simple. So yes, if you're in an environment, there's the potential to carry it with you. Yep, for sure. Um, I created um, a, a distribution policy um, for our department back in Winnipeg where paramedics can distribute that medication. And I think in a year we've handed out about six or 700 kits. Okay, that's a positive thing. It allows the community to treat these overdoses so that three minute clock isn't starting that quickly. And at the end of the day, that strategy will potentially reduce workload for hospitals. And there's a lot of opioid overdose patients that maybe won't access 911 anymore. And sometimes that's okay, sometimes, okay? All right, so to me that's pretty shocking. Uh, that stat needs to be updated. In about four years, we've lost over 16,000 Canadians to drugs like fentanyl. Um, at the peak, Vancouver was losing 165 people to these drugs. People don't, right? They think it's Canada, it's surely not that bad. 165 people a month, okay? All right, we'll switch and talk about methamphetamine, okay? I don't know your community that well, but I'm hearing cocaine, fentanyl, and methamphetamine. So got me pretty big uh, issue here. So we talk about methamphetamine, it's the polar opposite of the drug we just talked about, right? You've got your stimulant class, which will certainly be like methamphetamine, um, sometimes alcohol, Right? Methamphetamine was discovered about 1893. Um, when you watch certain shows, you'll hear people say amphetamine, right? Amphetamine and methamphetamine are much the same. It's always methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, methamphetamine permeates that blood, beam, blood brain barrier quicker than amphetamine. So we use methamphetamine. They think it was discovered in 1893 by a Japanese chemist. And what we don't talk about enough is the history of methamphetamine. We widely gave it to our soldiers during the right? And war is disgusting. Like, we never thought you could watch a war on TV. It's incredible, right? You turn on CNN and you watch a war on TV. War is disgusting. Um, at some point, humans have to learn to stop, stop killing each other. So it's kind of gross, but in war, it kind of made sense. They gave it to their soldiers in the form of pervitin. And these were basically methamphetamine pills that they were told, keep on popping these, march forward and kill. And you have to acknowledge war is gross and disgusting, but it kind of made sense. 
They got more productivity from those soldiers. They didn't have to eat, sleep, or rest, right? I always ask, um, who in the room thinks men and women are equal? <laughs> He's like, I'm not sure what he wants me to say, right? So I always ask that question, again, if it's a small setting or a huge group of people, nobody really wants to answer it. And my smart ass answer is, no, we're not. We're not. There's a ton of work that still needs to be done, a ton. And we know in, in certain cultures, certain, certain beliefs, women are incredibly powerful. And that's something that we, we really need to harness, correct? We need to build that up. And with the reason why I have that up there is thank God we've evolved. But in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, methamphetamine was not a controlled drug until the 1970s, not that long ago. If I'm talking to a group of high school students, they think that's 100 years ago. <laughs> it's not that long ago. So this was an advertisement in New York in the 1940s that encouraged women to use methamphetamine. They marketed it. They were profiting from it by saying, take meth that makes you have more energy, makes you thin, gives you energy, makes you a better wife, a better mom, etc. All of this garbage that they were spewing. So thankfully, we've evolved. That's from the... This one says, if you eat too much or you're, or you're depressed, take methadrine. So they were advertising and promoting methamphetamine use. Thankfully, we've evolved from that point. Anybody like that? Yeah. I could live inside of that chocolate cake. I could build myself a big chocolate cake house and be very happy. Um, when I put that picture up there, when I look around the room, a bunch of you did something and you did not realize it. It happens every single time. Some of you kind of shifted your shoulders and some of you kind of giggled a little bit. The reason why is when you think of something that brings you pleasure or something that you enjoy, you stimulate dopamine. Just by thinking of pleasure, the reward system of your brain has been activated and you spiked a little bit of dopamine. So when I think of chocolate cake, I'm spiking dopamine. That's like your happy chemical, right? Serotonin and dopamine are a neurotransmitter that is your happy chemical that we all produce. And that's what methamphetamine is targeting. It's targeting the reward system of your brain and it's releasing in human amounts of dopamine, that happy chemical. When you, when you brain scan somebody that uses methamphetamine, the reward system of their brain is lighting up like fireworks. It's not a treatment. We're going to talk about why that is. And something we used to say about methamphetamine is when you try it once, you're addicted and you're done for life, is it, it, right? That's the, the education that was out there, and that's wrong. I'm not saying try methamphetamine because you won't become addicted after the first time. The addiction is really scary, but you can't provide a message of you're done for life. You're removing any hope of people to recover from this drug. Recovering from methamphetamine is possible. It's extremely difficult, though. They're finding if you use high amounts of methamphetamine, your brain will stop producing dopamine. It's relying on that methamphetamine to do it for you. Okay, life does not exist without dopamine. And the scary thing is, is if I stop using methamphetamine today, it could take my brain up to one or two years to reset itself, to start producing normal amounts of dopamine again. So what do we do with all of these community members that are heavily using methamphetamine? It's extremely hard to recover from. It's possible, but very difficult. Um, I met a girl at a conference in Toronto, and she was in school to be a neurosurgeon, the smartest human being on the planet. And she made, the, she made the mistake, she says, of using cocaine just a little bit on, on weekends to, to, to push her through the weekend. People that say, I use cocaine because I'm a professional, or use methamphetamine because that's a dirty street drug, they've shown with federal testing if you're using cocaine, you're likely intaking methamphetamine as well. A lot of the cocaine supply is being tested at the federal level and it's showing cocaine mixed with methamphetamine. It's very, very dangerous. So she started to use cocaine and then she became heavily addicted to methamphetamine. She ended up being trafficked in Toronto and her presentation at this conference was she recovered from her addiction She's back in school to, uh, uh, to be a doctor. But she still says to this day that methamphetamine is still poking her, is still poking her on the side, tempting her, years and years after the fact, okay? 
Anybody eat when you're not hungry? Is that something? We all do, right? When we surround ourselves with food as a community, that brings us together. That's why we celebrate with food. When you eat food, you spike about 150% increase of dopamine. So when you're eating, that's why we keep eating. That big bag of chips, you're, you're only gonna have one handful, that never happens, right? You often just devour that bag of chips because you're riding a little bit of a dopamine high, okay? Video games and social media, about 175% increase. So for those of us that have kids, my generation was not raised on these devices. These have a place in society, but what's happening is they're looking at the, the young generation where their brains are still developing and growing, and what they're doing with these is they're constantly spiking dopamine by the addiction to these devices. When you feel acknowledged or popular, it makes you feel good, right? When you keep grabbing this device. So we have our kids in our society that are being raised expecting my dopamine is constantly riding high. And that's not normal, that's not a natural process. What happens when they lose their device? I'm not saying they're gonna go out and shoot methamphetamine. <laughs> but how, how, how is that youth gonna compensate for that decrease in dopamine production? So that's the generation we're raising. My dopamine will always be spiking, and that's not normal. So you have to monitor your use with these devices, okay? A healthy sex life, I'm gonna talk about this one for, for a little bit. About 200% increase. And the city of Winnipeg forbids me to put a picture of sex on my PowerPoint, so I can't show you a picture. But, I, you know, about, um, Five years ago or so, my phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was a lady, and she said, Corey, we've heard about your programming and your approach. Um, would you come and consider working with our women and girls? And I never say no to anybody. And for five years, I've had the pleasure of programming and working with the trafficked women and girls in our city. And that has been the most humbling experience of my career to date. Um, none of this is ever about me. None of it is. But I'll tell you, that first time that I walked into that room with probably the most traumatized humans on our planet, walking in a white male wearing a uniform, I was extremely nervous. Um, I, I wasn't sure how they were going to react to me. I was extremely nervous. And what's a victory for me personally and professionally is when you break down some of those barriers and you start to develop healthy relationships with those women and girls. Paramedics, law enforcement, firefighting, social services should be safe, safe spaces, right? They should be able to safely access all of those services. And what I tell our frontline people is those women and girls will not trust you, nor, nor should they. Be gentle, treat them with extreme compassion. I've learned more from them than they've learned from me, for, for sure. Um, a story I always tell about one of the girls that we were working with, and Somebody gave me flack one day for saying girls versus women. The reason why I say girls is these uh, people that are being trafficked are children. They are not over the age of 18 or even 16 sometimes. So one of the girls we are working with, she entered the trafficking world when she was about 14 or 15 years old in the city of Winnipeg. Um, and she was a girl from Charleswood where it's a part of Winnipeg that is fairly well, well to do, where society thinks nothing happens. And she met a guy when she was a young teenager, they're very, very good at what they do. And cocaine is often their um, drug of choice. Uh, he started inviting her to the big boy parties, made her feel popular and attractive, started to buy her things, got her hooked on drugs very, very quickly. And what this guy did, it's, a, it's an awful story, he got her heavily addicted to drugs, to cocaine, and then started to present her with big supplies of coke and said, I'm never going to charge you because I love and I care about you. You can use as much as you want. And then one day he presented her a big supply of cocaine. He said, I'm not going to charge you, but I expect you to sell half of this for me. You can use the other half, but you have to sell the other half. This guy does this for a number of months. And then goes up to this teenager and says, you owe me $60,000. I've been giving you cocaine for a long time. You, you owe me 60 grand to a 14-year-old. I don't have 60 grand. 
do you think a 14 year old will have 60 grand so this guy gives her three options says your first option is you pay your debt and you'll never see me again which is probably true says your second option is if you don't pay your debt I'm gonna kill your baby sister and then he presents this 14 year old with her final option to pay that debt off he pushes her a little card with an address he says you can go here and you can start paying off that debt and before you know it this beautiful year old angel is embedded in that trafficking ring and that's in my travels across the country I hear the same story so don't think you know somebody's story it takes 30 seconds as a frontline provider whatever uniform you wear to ask somebody what is your story it'll humble you very very quickly something that we don't do enough of you don't treat it like it's a robot or just a patient that's a human being put your put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say you know what what is your story I'm gonna stay with you for 20 30 minutes an hour tell me what your story is some people say what's the point I'm only with them for a short period of time the point is what if you're the only human being in their lives that shows genuine compassion you actually put your guard down and you say I actually genuinely care about you what is your story you'll be instantly humbled and that person that you've engaged with that compassion that will stick with them for the rest of their life okay all right Cocaine, about a 450% increase of dopamine. Okay, so we start ramping up. What do you think methamphetamine gives you for a dopamine release? Any guesses? People say like 500, 700. It's actually about 1,300%. And that's what's scary about methamphetamine. It is not a treatment for trauma. We know it's not a treatment. But what it does is it temporarily allows somebody to suppress their reality and they can kind of move on with their life it's not a treatment and then what's scary about methamphetamine is the first couple of times you try it you might get that 1300 percent flood of dopamine and serotonin but you'll never ever get that high again and that's very unique to methamphetamine some medications some drugs if you take a break you don't use them for months or years you may build up that tolerance again where you might access that level of high not with methamphetamine so what happens with an acute methamphetamine patient is they start binging that methamphetamine because they can't get that high again it's humanly impossible this is what we're seeing in Winnipeg I'm sure you're seeing it here as well um, again Winnipeg was never a needle city per se that's completely changed it's totally changed um, you can swallow it snort it smoke it or inject it the vast majority of methamphetamine patients are shooting with uh, needles for sure I've engaged people in the, the criminal justice system the, the treatment centers and the vast majority of methamphetamine patients say I started with smoking I turned to the needle very very quickly okay it's kind of what it looks like there are certain groups that I present to that I cannot show these pictures to um, I'm certainly not a, a drug expert on what things look like but the vast majority of what we're seeing kind of looks like this type of methamphetamine this I was given a little dime bag the other day I was at a presentation for the city and a lady approached me with the dime bag and she said I was on the bus and I found this uh, sitting on the bus bench and she says there was kind of kids poking at it so I, I didn't know what to do with it so she she gave me that little bag that was likely um, I'm tongue-tied methamphetamine so this is certainly everywhere I can probably put 30 or 40 different pictures of methamphetamine they all look a little bit differently and what I don't like to hear from people is I think my meth is better for me or healthier because it looks pretty like that blue stuff right don't make your meth decisions on what your methamphetamine looks like meth is meth is meth it has the same list of ingredients don't base it on what it looks like some of the psychological effects of methamphetamine I'm not going to focus on these but euphoria dysphoria self-confidence they are suppressing again right they're suppressing what that reality is and when you have to I'm going to repeat myself the vast majority of substance use is triggered by trauma 
So methamphetamine comes along, they can suppress that reality and they can kind of go this way. They can suppress all of that reality. Um, some of the effects on the body, it's no secret. When you go home today, you don't pour yourself a big glass of battery acid or farm fertilizer, right? That's what's typically in methamphetamine, nasty solvents and chemicals. And we're seeing patients with long-term methamphetamine use where their body is quite literally dissolving from the inside out. When I was in Vancouver the last time with uh, Gilbert, um, we walked into one of the tents that we saw and there was a young guy sitting off to the right. And I'm gonna guess he probably wasn't more than 16, 17 years old, just, just a young boy. And he was shooting methamphetamine. And parts of his body, you could see oozing fluid. That is somebody that's using methamphetamine for a long period of time where your circulatory system starts to dissolve because you're inputting all those solvents into it, okay? What we can't do is talk about methamphetamine and make it seem like every methamphetamine user is a violent human being. That is not true. The vast majority of methamphetamine use, they're actually pretty chill. You have to remember frontline providers are not called to folks that are managing well with their substance use. So we connect methamphetamine to instant violence and that's not true. But we can't minimize meth-induced um, psychosis. It's a very real scary thing. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it here other than some of the Mountie guys here. Okay, meth-induced psychosis is extremely scary. These are people that have to be managed through 911 and you likely will not be able to talk them down. They need long-term professional help. Chemical sedation is something that we can do within the city of Winnipeg for some of these patients. If they're at that psychosis state, we acknowledge you virtually cannot talk them down. It's where we call for assistance with Winnipeg police and we will chemically sedate these patients, okay? So Gilbert's asking how long to sort of flush the meth from their system. There's so many variables to that. Okay, there's not one answer. We're all different. How we react to substance use is, is all different. Um, but I will repeat myself by saying acute long-term methamphetamine use, remember for your brain to reset, could be one or two years. There are lots of variables there. On the extreme end, one to two years for your brain to reset to say, okay, now I can start producing my own dopamine. I don't, I don't need the methamphetamine to do it for me, okay? All right, almost done. I'm only gonna talk about the rush stage of methamphetamine. People think you're high for hours or days. That's not necessarily true. You can be high for hours or days, but they're never high enough. Because that 1300% spike of dopamine starts coming down within about 30 minutes. That's why folks will start to binge because they want to get back to that 1300% and it's humanly impossible. Is that making sense? So they start to binge on that drug, okay? Uh, some of the supportive care, I've already talked about chemical sedation. There's an antipsychotic medication we can give some of these patients. That's a good thing. It lowers the anxiety that they feel. The bigger hope that we want is when we transport these patients to the hospital, we want them to stay in hospital to access care. The vast majority of our substance use calls, when they're transported to a hospital and they're told, go to the waiting room for six, eight, 10, 12 hours, they're not sticking around. That's a system that's broken. If somebody comes to you and they're ready for help and they're saying, I'm ready, please help me, what happens when they're told we have no beds? or when they're told to come back in three months or two months or, so, or six weeks. There's a high chance that they're not going to return. And that's something that, that needs to stop. If you come to treatment and you're wanting help, you need to access that treatment in that moment. We can't keep telling people to come back, okay? Winnipeg, we do about 1,500 methamphetamine calls a year. Again, that is underreported by a mile. If I included all the isolated communities up north, that number would be staggering. It would be extremely, extremely high, okay? I'm gonna to touch on alcohol very quickly. Um, the reason why I don't touch on alcohol too much is typically given about one hour to present and it's very time limiting. We talk about all of the acute substances that we're seeing in our communities. The number one substance we still see is alcohol. 
Alcohol trumps everything else that we just talked about. It's the most traumatizing substance out there for communities, for family breakup, for trauma, et cetera, et cetera. The challenging thing with alcohol is it's more socially acceptable, right? We have sports teams that advertise with it. We have advertisement banners for alcohol. It's more socially acceptable. So we still have to acknowledge alcohol as being the number one incident that we see in our community. But it's hard to program and educate because we accept it socially. Yet it's the most toxic substance out there, okay? These are, our, these are our methamphetamine calls. So the ERs in Winnipeg used to see 15 methamphetamine patients a month. They now see over 250, just within the city of Winnipeg. And as some of you may know, some of the biggest challenges that we see is when some of the folks from the north are being medevac to the city, sometimes they're being lost within that big city vacuum, right? When they go from the rural setting to the big city, sometimes we're losing them. These are some of the federal testing results. What's interesting is 21% of fentanyl samples contain methamphetamine. That's right from the uh, federal government, which is bizarre. They're a completely different drug. So again, not the drug trafficking guy at all or how it's manufactured, but cross-contamination is a real, real big concern. They've shown that the cross-contamination of street drugs is really, really dangerous. If somebody orders methamphetamine, it goes on my scale on my table. Somebody wants methamphetamine, it goes on that same scale, same table. So things are being cross-contaminated as well. Okay? Okay, we'll save this for after, Gilbert. Uh, I'm gonna end on a really quick story again, and then I'm gonna pass it back to Gilbert. Um, I always end with my sort of professional humbling moment story. Um, what I can say is in a frontline role, be it policing, paramedics, nurses, physicians, social workers, community workers, your passion will be challenged, right? Your, your, your compassion, the integrity that you started with will be heavily challenged. And my humbling moment was many years ago when I was still on the street and we responded to a guy all the time. And this is a fellow that we would transport to the hospital. He would put his mouth beneath the um, hand um, station, like the sanitizer station, and fill his mouth full. Anything he could input into his body. And what I can tell you is everybody that he engaged in that healthcare journey beat him down. Nobody sat with him and put their hand on his shoulder and said, what's your story? Not one person did. We were pissed off because he was wasting our time, making us work overtime, all of these very first world problems. And I was humbled because I had to look at myself and say, what is my bias? I wasn't being as good to him as I should have been. And he's a guy that would stand on the street corner with a sign, right? Anything helps. Do you know what, what people did to him? They'd pull up and throw garbage in his face. They'd say, get a job, you bum. They would dehumanize him and beat him down further. And he looked at me one day when we finally put the pieces together and he said, you know what, man? I'm already completely beaten down. I feel like a worthless human being because of all of you. Nobody looked to engage him. His story was... He was a very successful businessman from another big city in Canada that was addicted to everything to suppress trauma. He went off to work one day and got a phone call that his wife and two kids were killed in a devastating car accident. So his life went from here to self-medicating with alcohol. He lost his job, he lost his house, his family was already gone. When his friends and his support found out he was using drugs, they isolated him. They pushed him off to the corner and were not there for him. And yet society reminded you, you're a worthless human being. Nobody acknowledged what his story was. So you got to take 30 seconds, humble yourself, put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say, what's your story? That impact is enormous and it will stay with them forever. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Joe, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Corey for that uh, great presentation. Um, 
I'm going to call up our next guest um, from the Winnipeg Police Service, uh, Indigenous lead, uh, Bonnie Emerson. And she's going to come and speak to us a little bit uh, about what she does uh, in the city of Winnipeg and a little bit of, of herself. I'd like to uh, make sure that our community members know that we have good staff at the clinic, our, our NADAP workers, people in the community that care for them. I want to, uh, people to understand that our trauma is real and we have to start reaching out for help. And I've done that many times in my life and I wouldn't be here today if I didn't do that. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. You got everything to gain. We have a beautiful community here in Norway House. I'm back home and I'm very honored to be here today helping create that uh, level of health, education. Uh, we can be better and we all have to walk as one. Nobody is higher than anybody. We all walk together as community members, families. We all know each other and love each other. Let's continue that today. After we hear this information, let's keep reaching out. Let's do better because we can. We owe it to our next generation and our leadership is behind it. We have to be behind it. So with any further ado, I'd like to call up uh, Bonnie Emerson. And then after that, we'll close off our uh, presentation. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I uh, was trying to, I think, Corey, I left your presentation still on, so that might be why. Th this was part of a different presentation that I left on. I was asked to come up and just, we know that what happens in Winnipeg affects the North, what happens in the North affects Winnipeg, and that there's a lot of sometimes challenges for rural communities when uh, coming to Winnipeg as far as uh, Thank you. resources. So. Just to give a bit of context, I always believe it's important to know uh, a little bit about who is talking to you and who I am. Uh, I'm a police officer, I'm a superintendent of the Winnipeg Police Service. Um, I've been a police officer for 30 years. Uh, I can't believe that when I say that out loud, but it is in 30 years, I grew up in Winnipeg, I grew up in the North End, uh, my mom's family came from Camperville and we belong to Sandy Bay First Nation. And it has been, as a Winnipeg police officer, I wish, I tend to go off on these side little tangents, so I'll, I'll say this quickly and then keep on topic and then I'll answer questions. But just a little bit of me that I've seen in the North End growing up in Winnipeg, I've seen some positive changes and I've seen some real challenges that have come out. It's almost like we've come full circle and I truly believe in working together and support and when uh, Gilbert asked to come up, for me to come up and I've worked with Corey in the past and it is about how can I, but the police service, support community and our community, even though we're Winnipeg police, I know that there's lots of people from all across Manitoba coming to Winnipeg. So I was asked just to speak really quickly about Winnipeg Police Service and then answer questions either formally or off to the side later. I think I'm going to be here for another six hours, I think, assuming I get the flight home. <laughs> maybe not, maybe longer. Um, Winnipeg. We actually, our police service hasn't expanded since we've actually lost per capita representation 10% um, as, as the Winnipeg population has grown, we've only moderately increased the police service. Winnipeg Police Service is, um, we have around 12% of our members, sworn members, are Indigenous. Uh, 16% are Indigenous, 12% are females. broken up into four uniform districts. So in Winnipeg, you have four uniform districts and those uniform districts are what everybody recognizes as the cruiser car. They're the ones who are responding to emergencies and they also have like a community support unit. And that community, so those units are go work with community organizations and, and help work on ongoing um, community uh, 
issues, and that's where I came from a lot of times, is working in the North End and downtown with community organizations. Um, I currently work right now at a headquarters. I personally have worked in uniform, detectives. I worked undercover uh, over 20 years ago uh, and did lots of drug search warrants and did lots of, uh, we didn't see meth or and crack first came out and 10 years drugs when it don't like to advertise and we a lot of the people working in the north this is fueling looked at it like but the, they're just prescription drugs like they're Valium they're Tylenol like everybody has those and you're like but they don't have them in the quantity and selling them on the street and it's making a difference so we did a bit of a an initiative where we uh, city police uh, college of physicians and surgeons pharmaceutical association and RCMP where we looked at where are these drugs coming from and where are they being sold? And I think it made a, a difference as far as raising awareness. Um, and then things, the opioid, uh, opioid, what I call crisis, exploded. Uh, nobody cares about that. So these are the uniforms uh, with Winnipeg. I had some questions when I uh, first got here. People were asking me about um, homeless populations. So I personally do work on police liaison training, so police response to mass demonstration and assembly, aka protests. But some of that also has to do with community engagement and looking at uh, homeless encampments, looking at um, uh, like people who mass demonstrating, people who, how do we support them? I was on the board of Main Street Project. When people are homeless, who is, how do they call, what do they go, where do they go for support? And there are a number of different uh, groups in Winnipeg where I say 30 years ago, the Winnipeg Police Service, we, the, we had a very defined role as far as what the police were and what the police weren't. And my personal perspective has been that as a number of organizations funding reduced, starting around 20 years ago, the police started getting phoned to respond. And then we started trying to respond to everything, and we absolutely can't, and I would argue shouldn't. And so we now have well over 600,000 calls a year to the police where we're not keeping up and we're not doing a good job. Partnering with subject matter specialists and experts like Corey, we did a project where we worked with uh, school kids of every school division in Winnipeg because I think there is a perception out here that Corey said that uh, drug use and addiction is uh, a poverty problem, is a certain area in North End and downtown ghettoizing drug addiction where it's sort of another way of saying them and us and that's simply not the case. Drug use amongst youth in this example is all across Winnipeg and so we did a project with all six school divisions in Winnipeg to actually encourage kids to mentor other kids not to use drugs and I, even though I personally want to do the abstinence which is like just don't use drugs the experts have told me that that just doesn't work and that I'm being naive. So I'm like, let's do whatever it takes for the people who know community. How do we coordinate and work together? And I understand that that's who's in the room, is that you all are specialists. So I am happy to share what we're seeing in Winnipeg, specifically with fentanyl and drug use, which is in the last two years, we've seen an increase in the number or in the strength of fentanyl. 
and we haven't seen the stickers Corey had mentioned earlier in the morning about the fentanyl lace stickers being sprayed. What Winnipeg Police Service will do, though, is if we have a large seizure or we're seeing something concerning, we will do news releases and share it publicly. And so that'll be for a media blast and that chief and council or uh, communications team can ask to be on that email list and then just be warned, you'll get a news release at least once a day as far as what you're seeing or what significant incidents are happening in Winnipeg. Um, so there is, this is just, I'm scrolling through the different units of the Winnipeg Police Service. We have seen since, well, COVID, the pandemic, and also the rise, co coincidentally, of some fentanyl and meth use, a drastic increase in violence in Winnipeg, like the violent calls now. To Corey's point, not all of it is going to be meth or drug induced. Some of it, a lot of it, if not all of it, is going to be co-occurring disorders like whether it's a, a addiction and mental health or a number of things happening at once. But there is definitely, and I have seen this, I work with probably different 20 different community organizations at different times, like another 10 or 30 different boards. And what community in Winnipeg is telling me is that and I have seen it within the police service itself, is that there is a fatigue and a mental health and we're all exhausted and people are feeling that too. And I think it's coming out in a whole different ways. Um, this is our armored rescue vehicle and I always get, I always, it's a little like defense mechanism on my part where I have to say it's not a tank. There's no weapons on it. It actually is uh, responding to emergencies where it is bulletproof and it can um, protect uh, emergency services and health services providers if we need to go to a scene and come out. Um, I work with, I just uh, got promoted in May. My old job was, I was a commander, an inspector, supervising what's called our community support division, which oversees diversity, indigenous partnerships, crime prevention, victim volunteer services, school officers, and cadets. So hardworking, these cadets. Just have to give them a little plug. Um, the rest is just different criminal code offenses and different questions that we get. Because somebody had asked about uh, uh, homelessness and addictions, I just wanted to be able to share that probably most everybody here knows, but 211 Manitoba is phone call and computer, and it gives resources from across Manitoba and Winnipeg. And you can plug in there housing, food, um, different resources counseling, and it should be able to direct you, and that'll be geographic or topic specific. Homelessness Winnipeg has a website um, that you could email them at info at nhomelessnesswinnipeg, and they are a collaboration of community organizations in Winnipeg that help supports. So um, Main Street Project is part of that, Help Seekers, Winnipeg Outreach Network, it's easiest if you go to the End Homelessness Winnipeg and just re remember that website and or 211. A lot of it is just where to go for help and how to answer the questions. So it, we try to simplify it to do that 211 um, phone number. Did I see a question? No? Yeah? Sorry? Well, so the question was the when the other organizations got funding, I don't know that it was necessarily, I, I hope that the police took over. We didn't want to, but 
police and health services are the two organizations that are open 24 seven. So 911 in Winnipeg is where everybody will phone. So the police service pivoted like 20 years ago where you had a call for service. If somebody was asking for um, housing, they would then, um, our, our communication center would refer them. But a lot of the time what we're seeing now is what's called a well-being check where we don't know what the issue is and so the police are responding to do that check. What we've just done in the last year is start a um, alternative response unit called ARC where we partnered with a health provider where we could go assess it and then the police are not involved but uh, the, this would be for mental health crisis where they are involved. So uh, the police have pivoted in recent times of looking at how do we have strategic partnerships where it doesn't need to be a police response. In fact, if the, the police core mission is about community safety. If safety is not an issue and there is somebody else who could do it, what we're looking for is legal, ethical, and moral ways to turn it over. And we're working through that through strategic partnerships because if there's imminent harm, we must respond. But if there's not imminent harm anymore, then it's about doing uh, um, you know, a response that serves the need. And a lot of that is about um, partnering with the organizations that are providing the support. So food scarcity is gonna be a big one right now where we are partnering with a couple of different organizations um, that provide services for food because the police often go into people's homes. Like there was a sad, sad case a couple years ago about a uh, senior. Um, the police, it, it, like she had no money. There was a call, they responded, trying to keep it anonymous for her. And she had no food, like none. And she was, had no, was, it was rent or food. And so the police officers from North End phoned me and said, you know, here's this senior, how do we help her? And we were able to partner her into the Bear Clan in Winnipeg, who at the time was providing food hampers for her. So that is, I think, the key as far as how do we pivot where we might be the initial response, but we know of an organization that provides a resource, how do we connect people who need that resource? Did that answer? Yes, the, um, so the question is, have we looked at our training? Our training, it ha has our cadets and recruits go through the academy. Our recruits are in the academy for six months. And there is a, the training has evolved where we have um, indigenous perceptions and diversity training in order connecting them where we have for the Indigenous Perceptions and History training, I've, we focus that for looking at the objectives of uh, TRC and MMIWG, the calls for action and the calls for justice. W what is it that the call said for training for the police to know as far as the history? But we also ask community members with lived experience and the organizers to come and speak so that the voice comes. So there's a little bit of a that training, the professionalism right now we look at um, WPS, Winnipeg Police is accredited, so there's an independent outside organization that says here's your standards in a whole bunch of different areas including training and they audit us to see whether or not they pass. But we also are most recently looking at trauma-informed and mental health training where you say um, certain areas are identified. So we're looking at trauma-informed and mental health. And then there was a second part to your question, besides the training. Oh, the hiring practices. 
Um, coincidentally enough, we are just re-looking at a number of different areas that came up at a, a meeting we had where we are looking at the hiring practice and we do look at not just the what you see, the criteria, there's the basic, um, uh, you know, high school, driver education, a criminal record check, uh, but there are looking at that community involvement and in the hiring process there's that strategic agility for how, how are you, like the thinking. Um, the, we looked at our hiring practice and looked at where are we on a diverse lens losing uh, applicants from, so, newcomer or indigenous applicants, racialized applicants for where are we losing applicants? And um, the significant in the last five years was in the resume process, the very first stage. So what we did was we had a couple of online resume training um, to say here's what you need to do as far as just to make it through that first stage. And then we have a talent acquisition team that actually works with uh, communities that, that would be interested as far as um, mentoring them to understand what the process is. Um, so that was really quick because I know whenever I'm before lunch that I better make it quick but I'm going to be here for a couple of hours still so if, if you have questions um, or want to come and chat later I'd love to connect. Gilbert did you want to say anything or because I could talk forever, I could move on to a different topic, but I figure <laughs> maybe I'll turn it over back to Gilbert. Thank you for giving me your time, and uh, hope enjoy talking to you all later. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, uh, Bonnie, very much for that uh, great short presentation. Because of time, um, you know, there's uh, things going on in our community, and, and due to respects uh, to our our community, um, we have to uh, close off fairly soon. But I'd like to say a couple of words. Uh, some, some of the topics we touched on: alcohol is a big, big factor still in our community, and it's affecting our young people. Uh, so we got to be very, very aware of what's happening, you know, right now with our with our youth and our and our people that are seeking those th those um, that help that we have. We're all working overtime, community wellness, uh, cl clinician staff. Everybody's working on, way above and beyond their hours, and I tip my hat to all our frontline workers here in Norway House that uh, you know they're doing a great job, but. They have families and commitments as well, so we need, as a community, to support them and make sure that as we grow, we get more healthcare professionals in the community, more training. Our new health center of excellence is going to be open uh, soon, and uh, that's a blessing to our community. But we still need more, and we'll continue to advocate. And if we have to be up here every three months doing presentations, that's what we'll do. And another uh, topic I'd like to touch on is trauma. Trauma with the residential schools and, gener and generational, intergenerational trauma is still alive and well and real for First Nation people in our communities. And that is a lot of triggers that we use to hide that pain and, and cover that pain, that trauma that we've all been through in our lives. And I spoke about my personal story, and I can only speak to mine, with my family and my family's history, but we all have our own stories. We all have people that are struggling, not only within the community, but within our families. So that's why these presentations um, in the community are so important. You know, people ask, what are we doing about drugs, violence? And this is what we're doing. We're starting these talks. We have to bring this in the open, and we have to walk together as a community, as I uh, alluded to earlier. So we can't stop. We gotta keep that message, that positive message going forward. And people wanna hear about, well, what's going on in Winnipeg? Why are we talking about that? The correlation, and I can speak to this, is that what's happening in Winnipeg happens in the north, and vice versa, as Bonnie alluded to, and it's true. 
a lot of the stuff that's happening in Winnipeg affects back home. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of our members are bringing this stuff back home and killing our own people and poisoning in our community, and that has to stop. We love this community, it's beautiful, we have a future, we have bright minds, young kids that need that start in life. And the only way we can do that is standing together as a community and saying, hey, Agane, enough is enough. So we have to start really taking a stand together. And you know what, speak up, ask, for quest ask questions, ask for help, there's no shame in that. And once we start doing that, we'll start being a more healthy, educated community as we move forward. We owe that to our next generation. We have to leave them with a positive and stronger message for their future. Things are changing, but what we leave for them is gonna set them off in their life and their grandchildren's life is the seeds that we plant today that continue to grow in our community in a positive way tomorrow. So with that, before I close off, I'd like to get James back up here to work some overtime and say a closing uh, prayer for us. And I'd like to thank our guests again, Corey Guest, no pun in intended there, and Bonnie Emerson. Uh, thank you very much for you guys to come to our beautiful community and share some of that information that is gonna resonate not only with our community, but with our frontline staff and what we're doing for tomorrow. So with that, I, I thank you so much. And James, can I get you up here one more time? Oh, I can't hear you. Training? Oh. Okay, and uh, we're gonna be at the health division at two o'clock for the naloxone training with Corey and Bonnie and, and myself. So uh, we're gonna have that at two o'clock. And now I'm gonna get the bishop to close it off. And thank you very much, James. Thank you. Let's all stand. I thank you, Lord, for, the, for this morning that we had this topic for our, for our community, Lord, to help us. Holy Spirit, to guide us. Thank you for these speakers, Lord. I give it a tragic month to keep them, Lord, as we work together as a team, Lord. Give us that wisdom and bless us as we go our separate ways, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Hey, I can say, James, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Everybody have a good day. And remember, let's, let's do this together. Let's walk as one, as a community. Hey, I can say, thank you.